I'm Michelle Sayer. I'm the adult program coordinator at the library. Welcome to the Kelly Herbert Library. Very happy to be having the joys and challenges of farming panel here tonight. We're co-sponsored tonight by Rural Vermont and by the Hunger Mountain Co-op who has provided these refreshments for us. So please get up anytime to enjoy it. I have a feeling people will be trickling in, so please make yourself comfortable. The bathroom is in the back corner of the room. If you need anything, please let me know. Otherwise, help me in welcoming our panel and our moderator, Ben Hewitt. Um, I guess I'll kick it off real quick and then and we have not rehearsed, just so you know. It's <laughs> like we're gonna see like uh, live performance art. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, I'm gonna introduce myself real quick. I'm gonna introduce um, the event a little bit more real quick. I'll let you all introduce yourselves and then we'll just like get into it. So nice to have you all here. Thank you for this wonderful intimate gathering. Um, normally I would ask you to move closer, but I think we've got a small enough room, so you could probably just find right where you are. Um, so my name is Ben Hewitt. Uh, I am here in part to help moderate and facilitate this panel, but also to represent rural Vermont. Uh, and Rural Vermont is a small statewide nonprofit that's based here in Montpelier. Is anybody familiar with Rural Vermont and our work? What do you What do you feel like maybe you know about Rural Vermont? Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> that was so unfair. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was you did a really but awesome but logo. <laughs> yes, we have a really cool logo. Check it out. It's a rooster <laughs> logo. Uh, so Rural Vermont, we've been around for almost 35 years now, and we have, in that course of time, works pretty consistently, I should say tirelessly, but it sounds too like self-aggrandizing, but we have worked very consistently on issues relating to equity, access, and opportunity um, in the community scale ag spectrum um, across the state. And we do that through um, education, you know, outreach, uh, advocacy, so we are very, very, um, very present in the state house. It's a big, a big part of what we do. Both, both trying to forward specific legislation that helps to sort of tilt um, the balance, uh, create a more equitable balance in terms of the regulatory, red, <coughs> regulatory environment, um, and but also serving as a little bit of a watchdog and a conduit between um, the farming community, our farming constituency, and member constituency, and the legislature because sometimes. Those are two worlds that have a hard time interacting or simply just for reasons of um, time allocation resources, simply people don't have time to keep up with what's going on. So we do that, um, organizing, education, and advocacy. Those are our primary um, vectors for our work. And um, we really feel that Vermont is at its best and strongest when all farmers have an equal right to prosper. Uh, and all Vermonters have access to nutrient-dense locally produced food. That's the sort of short elevator pitch. All right. um, so tonight I'm here and joined by three uh, folks who are farming in Vermont, I think to varying degrees, making a full-time living um, and or a part-time living uh, farming the land here in Vermont. Um, I don't, I know a couple of them, I don't know Missy, super well, but um, I would love it if you would all just give us a quick introduction to yourselves uh, and your farm and sort of what, you know, where you sort of sit within the um, Vermont farming spectrum, perhaps, and community. Um, and maybe if you just each want to spend, you know, a minute or two doing that, starting, I guess we'll go this sure. way, down that way. I'm Missy Axelrod. I have Drift Farmstead in Roxbury, which is just 30 minutes south of here. We're home of the Vermont Farm and Forest School, which is an educational center. Um, I have been farming for over 20 years, since right out of high school. Um, and then I went to college and studied sustainable ag before it was a thing in schools <laughs> and food systems. Um, started our college farm kicked out our dining service that was a big corporation and made it independent and that kind of led me on my path to continue farming um, but then also starting to intertwine education into it and starting to really use the farm as a classroom so that we can help shape our future starting young future consumers so we have a small family farm I grow in about an acre of organic vegetables, a couple high tunnels, one heated greenhouse. We um, raise livestock for meat. We have Scottish Highlander cows, pigs, chickens, and sheep. Um, and we grow everything for a winter farm share. We don't 
actually sell anything in the summer because uh, we're small enough that we can use our summer produce harvest for educational programming that we have and then save it, store it for the winter. So we do October to February. And the idea behind that is just to have food for when farmers markets aren't open as much, um, a lot of summer CSAs close down, summer gardens are covered in snow at people's homes, and to really use it as an ed educational tool in supplying food that people don't normally eat. So getting some of the funky vegetables that they might pass by at the farmer's market and here they're forced to eat it. So we include newsletters on how to store it in the house, how to prepare it, different recipes, talk a little bit of um, kind of some grassroots political farming stuff in our newsletters. Um, we invite people to come and work on the farm to, get, to experience what we do every day. Um, so we also do a lot of educational programming. I work in about a dozen schools here in central Vermont doing farm and food education in the classrooms as well as outside at our farm and other farms. And um, the idea is just to get kids outside and to learn in a different way through experiential learning connect with the community and learn about where their food comes from. And I work with NOFA Vermont, the Northeast Organic Farming Association, as a community mentor where I help bring farmers to the plate, um, into the classrooms, into community events, and um, helping to source local foods for uh, different areas throughout the state. Yeah. Oh. Um, my name is Kate Spring, and I run Good Heart Farmstead with my husband, Edge, um, who's home with our son right now. And we, ha we started in 2013, so this is our seventh year running Good Heart, and we now um, focus mainly on organic vegetables and herbs, and um, we... We sell uh, a lot of salad greens to local restaurants um, and otherwise focus mainly on CSA. And our farm mission is to help make local food accessible to low-income Vermonters. Um, mainly right now, the way we do that is working with NOFA Vermont and um, raising money to uh, provide subsidized shares through the Farm Share Program, uh, which has been really wonderful. And as we, every year we are kind of figuring out how to expand on that mission. Um, we started out very diverse with like pigs, chickens, sheep, um, turkeys, and then over the course of about three to four years, went right, just went to vegetables, um, which we can talk about later. <laughs> but um, yeah, just focusing on what our strengths are and uh, seeing how we can be more like community sufficient rather than self-sufficient um, has been a really big aspect of how we approach making our farm work. Um, my husband works full-time on the farm and I work, uh, I have a seasonal job as well. Um, and I, that's a that's where I'll, <laughs> I, I mean, we can talk, we could all talk for hours. So yeah, that's us in a nutshell, organic veggies. Um, oh, we grow about an, on an acre and a half and focus on um, no-till vegetable production. So, yeah. My name is Graham Unanks Rufinacht and I live in Plainfield right now. Uh, me and my sweetheart rent a home with a housemate. Um, and we, I lease land in Calais. Um, and I'm sort of in a farming transition point in my life, so we can, we can get into more of that, but I'll say right now, basically I've been farming with a business partner for three or four years, and we'd worked together for a bit before that um, in the realms of, we both, we both had a, um, we had this grass-fed beef business, we had a edible landscaping slash agroecology consultation business, building gardens, pruning all winter, planting mostly perennial woody crops like trees and shrubs, um, and also I have a background in um, herbalism, so perennial medicinals as well. And um, we would work with adult education through NOFA and through other venues, um, and I used to work in youth education at the Roots School for a little bit and then through Earthwalk Vermont, and I'm really curious to hear more about your program, Missy, because that integration, I found there's, there's more opportunities, at least in this area, to pursue um, tracking nature-based skills of that sort than the agricultural side. So I'd love to find some more integration opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, 
And at this point, my, my business partner left for a full-time job last year. We'd both been carrying part-time jobs. I think this is sort of the story of a lot of us who are trying to figure out ag is, you know, <clears throat> what part of your life is, is ag and how much of your income is that and what part of your life is something else that you're hopefully passionate about that can also bring some income to support this other passion you have. Um, so I actually work part-time at Rural Vermont and I have for the past two years, I'm now the policy director. Um, and this, of the last year, the, trans the business transition is such that <clears throat> I've taken over the, the grazing business and we lease 55 to 70 acres in Callis, in the Maple Corner area, from one, two, three different landowners plus a co-housing. Um, and so we do seasonal, largely seasonal grazing um, with the goal of sort of landscape restoration, ecological regeneration, and nutrient dense foods in our community. And the seasonal work really allows me to operate with a lower overhead um, <coughs> on leased land. And I commute about 12 miles a day to move my animals, which is actually 25 minutes each way. So it, it means that I only have to do that seasonally, though. I don't have to do that in the wintertime, which is great right now. Um, so yeah, that's largely where I am at right now, running this, this grass-fed beef business um, by myself, transitioning from having this consultation and beef and education work and figuring out how that all lives when it's just me. Um, trying to live out these things. Um, so I'm still doing some pruning and some consultation and garden stuff on the side as well. And that's where I'm currently at. Cool. Okay. I want to ask uh, a question, um, I guess, of both Katie and Graham at the moment, um, because you're both ones who have also have off-farm employment. Uh, and I'm curious, um, would it be your wish and your hope to be farming full time, uh, or do you prefer to have off farm? And you're welcome to answer this too, because I know you're also out in the schools, and maybe mm -hmm. that's you know that's relevant to you too. But I, I'm just interested to hear if that's like something that you're doing out of necessity, um, and and that may not be mutually exclusive. Yeah. Maybe it's out of necessity, and you would prefer it. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious to hear you reflect on that a little bit. Yeah, do you, I am happy to go for it. Okay. Start, yeah. So. Um, uh, for the first number of years, our goal was to exclusively run the farm, like, and that be our only income. And we did have a few years where, well, probably like two years where it was our only income. And I would say that is Edge's goal. And I am someone who, there's a lot of things that I'm excited about and want to do. So, um, for me, partly it is financially, uh, a financial aspect where, you know, farming with your partner, whether it's your husband or wife or like, or anyone, I think the financial, <clears throat> like being on the same financial uh, page or at least very close to each other is really important. And so Edge has a higher tolerance for, um, what I feel like is a really uncomfortable, can be really uncomfortable. <laughs> um, so, so that being said, I, for the last two winters have been working. Um, I ha I'm lucky to have a remote job that I really love and work with people that I really love. So it, it started out as um, like, okay, I'm just gonna do winter work to take some pressure off the winter time um, and has turned into working with a team of people that I really enjoy. So um, it's become both. And it also, the other work I do, I end up learning a lot about business and marketing. And, and so it ends up feeding right back into the farm. Mm -hmm. So the two have become really, really helpful because after a day of working on the computer, I'm really grateful to go outside and or just go into the greenhouse in the winter time. So um, yeah, I think, just to kind of sum that up, I think for me, I, can, I see myself continuing to do other work um, that will, that feeds into the farm. And that also goes to like, I want to incorporate some non-farming activities on the farmland. So having workshops and educational aspects and um, like writing an artist retreats on the farm and allow people to interact with the land in ways that are, that's not just farming is important to us in our 
like overall mission of again like connecting people with the land so um i see myself continuing on that path while edge will while and it also allows edge to be full-time farming so it works out for <laughs> for us in that way right now and it has evolved over the last seven years so mm. yeah um i think my the answer is i don't know i think it, it depends and it really changes day to day sometimes. <laughs> like today, I was inside um, looking at it like this beautiful 50 something degree day and being like, oh, I wish I had some great farm work to do, but I have to do all this paperwork for farming and other stuff as well. Um, I think, um, you know, I'm still in this transition of thinking about a, part, a business partnership to thinking about this just as a, by myself, which is actually a, a big and sort of complex transition um, to feel your way through as well as to sort of structure, structurally design your way through. Um, so when my business partner and I start, came together and merged, sort of I was doing the beef and education work and he had been doing the, the um, edible and medicinal nursery and the um, landscaping work and we've both been sort of landscaping together uh, and realizing that's probably not legal for too long, we gotta figure out how to make this legal and we figured, well, the landscaping, the services side has a, has a more solid income with it, right? So that could potentially, if we joined that in a partnership with some of the production side, whether that was the nursery or the beef or other pasture management or whatever we moved into over time, then we were hoping there could be some balance of like, if production isn't that much of an income source, because production agriculture is not an income source generally, um, you know, the services side would be more of a reliable income. Um, and our vision over time, being sort of landless farmers in the sense of not owning a piece of land, uh, was to transition from our part-time nonprofit or side work to full-time work together, but providing a diversity of things. So what, what that looked like wouldn't necessarily be 100% of our time devoted to production agriculture. Um, more of the vision was how do we, you know, how are we outside all the time? How are we accomplishing our, our goals of you know, regenerating the land and working with what's being talked about as regenerative agriculture, how are we bringing youth and adults and other folks, not only to agriculture, but also to the land, like you're saying, Katie, in general, and those kinds of relationships, and how can we make that place a place where we live and we don't have to commute to? Because um, it's just logistically also, that's just so, commuting to animals is like a very serious challenge at times, especially when the weather is not ideal um, and you don't have infrastructure necessarily to deal with it. Um, so our goal had been, and I think my, my goal is ultimately to make my livelihood more from being outside and working in the ways with the land that um, I think provide really good outcomes ecologically, but also for my community and for human health, et cetera. Um, but I do, you know, the work I have found myself getting involved in, in terms of that reliable income, has always been stuff I've been fortunate, I think, and that's been something I've been passionate about, whether it was working with at the Maple Hill School in Plainfield and co-managing that farm, and doing that work, or working at the Root School, or working at, with, with Youth at Earthwalk, um, or now for the last couple of years working at Rural Vermont. And I'd say that that opportunity really just came also from, from pursuing a passion. I, I actually got in trouble with the state through farming for on-farm slaughter practices. Um, I was using essentially just distributing meat to too many people, which we actually now changed the law this year such that what I was doing could be, would be legal now, which is really fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and that drew me, Rolf Monster sort of came to my aid and was like, sat, me, sat, me with the, the, sat with me at a table with these intense meetings with the Agency of Ag, and when I was told I was threatening the Vermont brand with what I was doing, and, and other literally told I was threatening the Vermont brand. Um, and they invited me sort of into, um, into the work they were doing and asked me if I wanted to join the board and get involved because I was sort of getting more politically involved and getting energized around these issues. And so serving on that board in a volunteer capacity for a number of years ultimately helped me recognize my passion for, like, for make, trying to make change at the policy or at the organizing or advocacy level. Um, so I definitely enjoy the work and I'd love to be outside more. <laughs> Did you want to answer that one also? Sure, you, he had his hand raised. Oh, uh, absolutely, I'm oh, sorry. No, I don't know if this is a question for one or, uh, which one? Which one of you three was the one who said you guys like had like cows and all that? Who, who like 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 meat cows? You have meat cows. Oh, maybe both of us. You're the yeah, highlanders. And too. I do. Yeah. 
So how do you like deal with soft seed meat to meat cow? You got you got to kill it eventually to do it for meat. But like, do you think it would be possible if someone like say for example someone like me who's very like I really like animals and all that sort of stuff. I know it's possible to like animals and eat them at the same time, but like. Do you think it would really work if it's someone like me who really likes animals, who's raising animals for me and killing them? Like, like, it's, is there ever a time where it's sort of hard to bring yourself to do? I mean, obviously, I'm not sure if you do it yourself, or if you like have like someone else do it for you. It's but. a good question. I spiritually struggle with that question all the time. Philosophically, I really believe that animals are a part of a system on a farm, yeah. and we really try to have this holistic, closed-loop farm where we have our animals, they supply you know, nutrients to our vegetable fields, they mow our grass instead of using tractors, and that philosophy is really, really important. And we do some of our slaughtering on farm for our family, and then the rest have to go off to USDA inspection, um, or state, depending on what we're doing. And I can't slit a throat. I can't do it. Like, I just won't do it. And I keep going back and forth with this, like, spiritual connection. Should I not be eating them? I can't actually do the kill. So there's something wrong. I, I'm not connected enough to that animal and to that piece. But I'll butcher them. In fact, on Saturday, I'll be butchering all day Saturday and Sunday. And I don't mind that. But that kill piece is something I just can't get past. And recently this summer, I was sitting around a fire. And I was saying to my husband, I'm like, I think I should be vegetarian again because I cannot do the kill. And he said, that's okay. That's what partnerships are for. I'll do the kill. And I was like, okay, all right, we're good with that. I'm never going to kill an animal, <laughs> at least not yet. And I've been raising animals for a long, long time. And yeah, I think it's just a choice you have to make. And I just can't take that step forward. And yeah. if I don't have to, I won't. If I'm in the woods, maybe I will. I'm hungry. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, can I just jump yeah, in please. real quick? So I... One of the main reasons I started farming was because I wanted to eat meat again, and I had been a vegetarian for like six years, and then um, through a series of like books, like Animal, Vegetable, Miracle, or, and The Omnivore's Dilemma, decided, okay, I want to start eating meat again, and for me it was really important to be able to kill, uh, to slaughter an animal. So I, after college, started working for the Green Mountain Girls Farm, um, and I think I was their first employee. Um, and by the end of, by Thanksgiving, I did slit a neck, just one, but I did also, but the rest of the time I was like, man, turkeys are heavy after you're like picking them up all day. Um, also, you're probably not pleased when people are picking them up. You know, just like hang them upside down and swirl them around and they <laughs> calm down a little bit. But, um, but I also feel like that Thanksgiving was the uh, most present I've ever been for eating a meal. And um, I don't slaughter animals all the time. I don't raise livestock anymore. But like what Missy said, what I found through farming is that, um, well, just to back up, one of the main reasons I stopped eating meat was because of factory farming. And I felt like that was just terrible. Um, and as I progressed, I also found, I started to feel like my, my decision to just like take myself out of that equation was not for me personally as powerful as deciding to become supportive and active and like um, in a more humane and regenerative system. And so, so coming to eating meat and slaughter and loving animals and I've definitely been you know, attack. You know, we have we do name our our livestock, or when we had livestock, we named them, except for the chickens. But um, there's, I think, just a certain kind of reverence that that to me seems to be required, and what I've and what I've seen from a lot of livestock farmers, and a certain respect that comes to it. And I think whether you eat meat or you slaughter meat, no matter what agriculture includes some form of death whether you're killing rodents or um you're slaughtering livestock and um there's like that's that's just part of it and there's you kind of have to find where you fit in with it but i don't think it's impossible i think it's actually the best livestock farmers are people who love their animals yeah. so mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, can I think you both had great <laughs> answers too, but um, yeah, I think the hardest thing I do every year is 
is put my animals in a trailer. And I think that's also one of the hardest point, parts that get a little bit of betrayal in that process of sending them to a facility to have their lives taken, which is one of the reasons I got in trouble with the state. <laughs> um, but you know, there are, so there are, so it's hard. I do love my animals. And you know, I, I worked with my housemates to kill just 30 chickens for our own freezers the other day. And it's, yeah, it's always, it's probably just the hardest day every year. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, but it's like, you know, I can't speak for you, the choices you'll make. I also had a long period of time in my life where I was a vegetarian and vegan and played with those different food choices. And as it came more into my own understanding of how agriculture and ecology and, you know, food sovereignty and people being able to not depend on the chemical industry for inputs to your systems really depends on livestock in a lot of ways. And um, so that's sort of part of the transition that got me to, to thinking and exploring more about that and really making that choice to get into eating meat with the intention of taking those lives myself and trying to take that responsibility and, and feel more into that. I want to um, want to follow up a little bit on something you just mentioned, Graham, which was that, you know, that sort of sense of betrayal in having to load your animals onto this trailer, which I sort of, from your tale, I'm, I'm understanding a little bit that you do primarily to abide by a regulatory particular regulatory environment. And so it leads me to a, a somewhat, I guess, broader question um, for all of you, which is in what ways, well, first of all, um, you know, what would you want people to understand, I guess, about the intersection of sort of politics and policy and agriculture? You know, what, what one thing, I guess, would you want them most to understand? Because there's probably a lot you could want them to understand. Um, but also, in what ways do politics and policy uh, impact your operation and how you run your operation, for, for better or worse, in your opinion? I think policy comes into play in some ways, in important ways, so that you know your food is safe. Um, but from my standpoint, knowing your farmer is number one, and that making connections with your farmer, knowing how your food's grown and processed is really foremost more important than state regulations, federal regulations. And I would love for small farms to be, look at as small farms and not have the same regulations as these huge corporation farms where you do want to know that it's coming from California, that it's followed certain procedures, but to be able to process animals on farm, to be able to have work trade or interns and to be able to have that community base on farms and not have to have workman's comp, which costs tons of money and payroll. And that's what's hurting farms. And I think that political piece, looking at the big farm all the way down to the little farm, they're two different worlds and that there need to be different regulations for small farms, both um, with workers, employees, and um, like um, policies for how you grow your food and how your um, safety and HACCP and everything is. I think that's something that's really important, especially for Vermont, but for anywhere where people are wanting to know their farms and to be able to make it profitable for small farms with all the politics and policies. Do you have anything on that? <laughs> I'm, sure I did. I'm like trying. I'm just trying to think. What yeah. is one thing? I'm trying to narrow things down. It's a big yeah. question, you know, the intersection of politics and ag. It's sort of a question also of like of, um, of policy of regulation. You know, what is included in politics? Um, but I think if there's one thing that I think is important for folks to know who maybe aren't in the farm world is that there's a real um, feeling, especially amongst a lot of the conventional farming community and the, and the dairy community, that um, regulations have, that the regulatory environment has um, asked a lot of them over the years and brought them to where they are now in terms of the systems they have on their farms, um, the infrastructure that's there, that there's a history of policy and um, industry pressure that brought them to where they are now, whether it's the creation of liquid manure as a substance. Um, whether it's the implementation of concrete floors or bulk milk tanks and how that affected which types of farms could or couldn't exist historically. So there's a policy effects our, our working landscape and what we see around us right now. The farms that exist and don't aren't a result of just good farmers and bad farmers. They're a result of policy 
to a great extent in industry and how those things interact. Um, I think that's really important to know, especially when we, we do recognize things like ag is contributing substantially to the water quality issue, but there's a history to this in as much as um, folks don't want to be contributing to water quality issues and they want to be part of the solution as well for the most part. Um, I think it's in, and when, when there's new regulations consistently being proposed or put in, in place, some of them make sense, but some of them also, um, there can be resistance because folks say, hey, you, a lot of regulations that come in the past that brought us to where we are now. What's your assurance that me spending this much more on my operation is going to create the outcome we want as opposed to bring us to another unexpected outcome? Um, that said, I say, you know, how do they impact our operation? You know, there's a balance, I think, between, as, as you said, the scale appropriate use, and that goes for slaughter facilities too. Like, depending on how, I'm not going to want to do slaughter. 10 to 20 cattle on my farm every year, you know, that would be a lot for us to take on without having a more substantial facility ourselves. So it's really helpful to have those types of facilities. Um, and I think, you know, there's actually been some really positive impacts in terms of policy on, on my farm in the last couple years in terms of opportunity. And I think Vermont, Vermont farmers actually have more opportunity than a lot of folks across the country and other states. I went to this National Young Farmers Coalition gathering in D.C. last year and just heard a lot of folks asking about the programs here, hearing a lot about the programs here. Um, the fact that we even have ag easements in the land trust is, is significant. So we, we do have a lot of positive things from current use to you know, ag easements in the land trust to also just this year something that really is going to benefit me is this new federally approved practices program. It's a program that's Federal, it's across all states, and each state offers different money for different conservation practices. So, per acre payments for cover cropping on larger commodity farms, but now they're doing per acre payments for intensive grazing management. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, that's like, okay, I got you know a thousand extra bucks in my pocket at the end of the year. That actually makes a big difference because that might actually be my margin. <laughs> um, and you know, I think there's room, there's room to see more improvement there. So there's. There's ups and downs, and mm -hmm. we have the power to, to affect it, too. Do you want to answer a different question, or do you, are you going um, to answer that? I'll, uh, I feel like, like the things as a vegetable farmer, things that have affected us are things like the Food Safety Modernization Act, or FISMA, which for us, um, we're small enough that we don't <clears throat> fall underneath that, but that did um, prompt the state to create a, like a statewide, or not the state, the Vermont Veg and Berry Associate, Growers Association started um, a program called CAPS, which I feel like, which is basically the state level for smaller farms. So it's a community accredited produce safety program. And I feel like that has been great just because it's prompted us to put all of our practices into writing. So again, it's just like, it didn't really make us change anything, but in terms of vegetable growing, that's been a big aspect for, you know, what what you can put on, like it, it even it even affects like the uh, levels of compost or manure, um, what you can put on the soil, and that also has to do with like runoff and and water um, quality issues. But in terms of things that have been harder for us definitely like employees we've often we're kind of at this place where we've seen that if we wanted to like jump up and wanted for us to both be full-time year-round um, we know what that could look like but it would really require employees and we have had one summer I think maybe two summers no just one where we had employees and one employee and the cost for one employee and workers comp is really hard to take on so we're out of I think there's a lot of farms in Vermont and more so more and more um, farmers who are doing small intensive growing so you're seeing like one to five acre vegetable farms and I think that is a trend um, one because you can grow a lot of food on a small acreage um, with intensive techniques but um, also, you know, it's really expensive to buy land, so it's easy, it can be easier to start a smaller farm, um, but all the regulations around employees versus um, interns or volunteers, it's, it's hard to manage that um, at the size we're at, um, so. 
that's where we're <laughs> that's where we are kind of in that catch. So I think I'd like to ask two more questions and then I would like to open it up to and make sure we leave plenty of room if other if folks have other questions. And if they don't, I can just keep going because <laughs> I'm endlessly wanting to ask questions. <laughs> um, but uh, so the two questions I'm gonna ask, and I'm gonna ask them at the same time, um, for the sake of efficiency. <laughs> Right? I'm going to give you each the opportunity to answer. So those two questions are, um, the first is, how do you understand your value to your community beyond the food you produce? And how would you describe that? And I would also like you to, once you've done that, I would like you to describe one moment from the past week in your farming life that is particularly meaningful for whatever reason, either because it was so awful, <laughs> or it You're was the end so of the year. <laughs> transcendent and amazing, or anywhere in between. Uh, um, I'll let one of you go first. <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'll go first. So the value we offer our community. So we, we are based in Worcester, so just about 10 miles from here. Um, and we, so as I said, like one of our core or our core mission is to help make local food more accessible. And so one of the, one of the ways we do that is by raising, uh, doing fundraising. So we'll have like pizza nights. Um, we usually, that's our biggest one. We'll do pizza nights and then other small fundraisers. But what, but beyond like, helping make food accessible. My favorite part of the farm is seeing our CSA members come each week and there is a visible change from when they open their car door to the, when they get to the farm stand. And part of it is like, we have a very beautiful view of the Worcester range. So when you come up, have you, you've been there? Yeah, yeah it's beautiful. I don't know, have you been up there? I know where it is, so I can okay. imagine. What so I'm gonna pull everyone <laughs> if you've been up there. <laughs> but um, we it's really hard to even capture it in a photo. But um, if you wanna see photos, they're on our website, which is goodheartfarmstead.com. But um, there is such, uh, there's like, Sometimes it's a sense of relief or just like I can see people just sort of like shed their days and they just look out at the mountains um, and come and get their food and there's conversations that happen. And we have some people who have been with us in our CSA for like the full seven years and other people who just have started with us. And every time people come to the farm, they just remark on how beautiful it is. And um, I was having a conversation with a CSA member a few weeks ago about beauty and just how beauty is a really essential aspect of our life and of um, our experience. And I think um, I, I've said before, like it can sound a little like, well, you can decide what it sounds like, but I've, <laughs> but I've, I've said before that one of the reasons I farm is for beauty. And I think that in the midst of all the things happening in the world, it's really easy to feel overwhelmed and to feel depressed and to feel like there's nothing you can do. And when I'm out in the field or when I'm just like taking a break from my computer job, um, there's, there's the ability for the farm and for being out on the land to like wake you up and help you be connected and um, connected to the soil, connected to all the really good things that are happening in life. And so I think beauty is actually a really essential aspect of what we offer and um, which is like we, we give people free pick your own flowers all summer. And it's like my favorite thing to see people come back with bouquets and just, it's like, it just is, a, a visible shift um, from like the rest of their <laughs> days. And I think um, that to me is like a way, f giving people a place to come and connect to the land um, that feeds their souls as well as their bodies is um, just really important. And to me that doesn't really, 
that can that can be interpreted however you need to connect with the land but i think that we're really missing that in our day-to-day -day life and um it's really important for people to have some sort of physical connection with the soil um and so let's see then a, a moment yeah so this was a little bit more than a week ago <laughs> but we were planting garlic and um we were finishing up the garlic. Uh, it was a day that I was working, my other job, but I went out at the end and just finished planting garlic with my son, who's six, and our hus and my husband, not our husband. Um, <laughs> 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 and you know, just the light, the sun was setting, and um, to be able to do that as a family has it's just really wonderful. Um, I don't really have any specific hopes for what my son will do when he grows up. I just hope that he always has a connection and relationship with the land. And so that's that was probably one of my favorite moments from the past. Um, can I add one more thing? It was just a Absolutely. note that I, um, that I can't remember. So, someone was saying something that made me think of this. And um, one of the things I think too that we offer the community is that we're taking care of this land that probably otherwise would have just become a residential home. Um, but one of the things we try to do, or one of our, the things that our, our uh, organic certifier mentioned that we were having a conversation about is matching your soil with your market. And I thought that was such a, when she put it like that, I feel like it's a really important aspect in terms of like if you're thinking about growing, whether it's like livestock or crops, um, everything, all the success of your farm will depend on how you take care of your soil. And for us, we're on this slope. We've <laughs> been building soil for seven years, um, but it still comes down to like, well, you know, we're just not at a place where <laughs> broccoli is very successful, but we can do all these other crops really well. Um, and I know just like this panel and, um, and you being the moderator, like I feel like soil um, should just be really highlighted as like the number one thing that any of us have on whether you're gardening or farming. Um, so just wanted to slide that in there too. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think there's lots sort of explicit values that we, we can offer, and I think at least at this point in where I'm at, <clears throat> clearly some of the ambitions around um, education on the farm and off the farm have taken a, a backseat to sort of business transition. I also actually tore my meniscus this last winter and was basically on crutches for six months, so like there's a lot of transition in my life in terms of um, how I'm realizing this value in the community, what I'm able to, to give. Um, but I think what I'd focus on for the purpose of this, which I think is important to conversations happening more broadly in the farming community right now, is, is the, um, so we could talk about it as enhanced landscape function, you know, um, as growing soil, as Katie said, as hopefully growing models and opportunities for people to see different ways of managing landscapes and really growing biodiversity. When you're growing soil, you're growing the capacity of that soil to hold water and to filter water from contaminants. Um, you're slowing down rainfall. Uh, you're, you're, you're creating more nutrient dense food because you're creating more biologically active soil which can cycle nutrients and other things from the atmosphere and the soil all the more efficiently. Um, and I think uh, at scale, we can see this, you know, at a community, like we're, I'm right above Curtis Pond in the watershed there. So we're on Robinson Hill Road and there's about 50 acres <clears throat> on a very steep hillside and part of it on, you know, a little, a little more undulating hillside there. So we're around a pretty serious body, body of water. Folks use it for swimming um, all summer long. Um, there's certainly like wetlands and forests at the bottom that can help to filter water coming off the pasture. But I actually imagine that this pasture is filtering water far more effectively than the forest around it, and I hope that that continues to be the case. We know we can grow soil at a much faster rate using the grazing techniques we're doing on this land than how quickly forest can grow soil. Um, and what I really hope in terms of maximizing that is just um, 
is trying to figure out how we can how we can do this because I think what's really holding landscape managers from farmers to your backyards from from really improving is um, of course there's educational stuff but it's really like it's the it's the economic side there's no there's no explicit valuation of any of the sort of growing soil of improving water quality there's sort of carrots and sticks and there's do this practice or do this practice in a certain way so I'm hopeful that we can figure out ways of actually um, some folks are talking about is hiring farmers to essentially grow infrastructure. Or could we hire someone to build a bridge? You're gonna hire us to come and not just grow food, but you could hire, I'd be getting paid for growing soil and creating these certain services. So I'm, I'm hopeful that those values will be um, both quantified and publicized and, and recognized and we can sort of bring that to the educational and other elements as well. So I hope that's a community that I'm, or a, a service I'm providing to the community, uh, as well as the food that comes from it, and that's just specifically from the farming, I guess, um, and the practices. And in terms of meaningful moments, um, I, I just sent all my animals to slaughter over the last couple of weeks. So, um, and the last two cow-calf pairs over to a place they overwinter. So, um, it was also my second year grazing on a new pasture as well. So there's been a lot of sort of meaningful moments of um, watching my life and this landscape and the business and the animals all in transition at the same time. And just watching the year close and this, this combination of a couple of days of, um, you want me to get to a moment? I'm sort of looking at story. What's the moment? Um, you know, it's really, it's a hard one I have to say goodbye. I have this one cow who I've had for five years. She was. My plan was never to keep animals over winter simply because I don't have the infrastructure. It's not financially sound, but as <laughs> and old farmers always warn you, don't fall in love with cows. Um, but you know, I had a, a cow that came to me bred. She was a heifer and she came bred. So when it came to time to slaughter, we weren't gonna send a bred heifer to slaughter. So we kept her and she calved out over winter and um, she happened to get bred again that winter in a, where I overwintered her. And this cycle has happened again and again and again. Um, and she's the sweetest cow at this point. There's I keep her around because she calms the herd, she leads the herd, she knows me, she, she knows it all. So beyond the financial side, which we're all forced to think about so much, um, there's all these other assets in the relationship itself. So at the end of this year, I just sort of, you know, she's this one trusted sort of, it's like me and her and my new farm dog. And, uh, you know, but she, I had to say goodbye to her and I brought her back to uh, the farm where she overwinters and I, and I feel like, She's never super excited to go back there. Um, she, you know, it's totally different to be moving, moved every single day to fresh green grass, or multiple times a day to fresh green grass than it is to be sort of put in a place where you're just eating hay on this big open exposed landscape. So it was just that moment of, of uh, seeing her for the last time, and I'd seen her every day, you know, multiple times a day for however many months, and just saying, saying goodbye to her and her calf, and. Um, just, you know, wishing them the best. And seeing that look in their eye, you know, it's, I don't know. You can't see an animal for a while who you're close to, just like a human you're close to, and there's just a, the expression is what's expressed, it's what you're, meaning it's just sort of a, a, um, a bittersweet moment. I'll leave it there. Well, I think my, I'll start with my aha. Well, it started out as a negative aha of our fence being down and animals out everywhere. <laughs> oh, no. For like two days, trying to figure out walking the fence over and over again, and finally we realized our charger was down. Um, and I was like, animals, why do I have animals? <laughs> and then I kind of went back a week and was remembering a time um, when I had a group of first and second graders at the farm all day for the first time with this group. And the teacher was really scared to have them there because she was afraid of their intense behavior problems. And just that I'll have seeing them so grounded and so engaged. And these are the kids that are bouncing off the walls, like need a, they almost need a one-on-one, -on -one, each of them. And they're just, they're just who they need to be, connected to the ground, the soil. And that kind of brought me back to value to the community. I always said I would be a big production farmer. And somehow I kept myself not from being a big production farmer because I am too antsy, I need to do lots of things at once, and I couldn't just do one row for days. Um, and it brought me back to why I have this community farm and why I bring um, kids of all ages, including adults who are kids on farms, to the farm and to bring them back to that soil and to be grounded and figure out where their roots really are from and where good food comes from. 
you know, what it takes for that food to get to their plate. Um, and I think that education piece is what we really value and sharing with our community. Awesome. Does anyone? Thank you. Does anyone have any questions, comments? So I'm going to ask you so many questions. No, you only asked one. Um, <laughs> so I've got two questions that are completely unrelated. Is that okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, the first one is, is that I was reading about when I'm sort of like looking over, when I was sort of like writing down, like jotting down a basic idea of what I would, because I'm interested in going into farming later. So first off is, is it possible to get into farming directly after college? Because I was talking with, um, it was my dad, where he said probably more advisable, at least, oh, but it, I mean, it all depends on the circumstance. He said it's probably more advisable to, at least for you, to have like another job and then sort of build farming off as a side and then gradually those two overlap. Is it possible if you do it, if you quote unquote do it right to get into farming as a full-time job right after college? Or does it, is it usually better if you pick another job, go from there, and then sort of build like farming off on, a, on the side and then they eventually overlap? Um, so I, my first job after college was on a farm and I didn't know I wanted to have a farm. I just um, wanted to, I thought I was just gonna have like a summer job. And um, I think that it really depends on what your vision is and what you want to do and what your resources are. And um, I have a friend who went to, I think, two years of school and then <clears throat> dropped out and started his own farm. And um, he eventually started working for, you know, now he runs another farm that's not his, but it that experience of running his own business led him to where he is now. Um, and, and I've heard of people who have no experience at all and they're just like, I'm going to go for this and they figure it out and it's really hard. But if you like, I, you know, anything that's worthwhile, it's just going to have a lot of challenges. Um, I worked on four different farms before we started Good Heart and I feel like the best for me, experiential learning is really helpful and seeing different, um, different types of operations, different sizes, um, it all really helped us figure out what we wanted to do. And, and even once you start, your farm will change over the years anyway, but um, you can get a job on a farm and be farming full time while being paid and working and getting that experience to then bring to your own operation if that's what you're wanting to do. So that's I always think it's good to get experience from other farmers, and it's a really good way to learn. Right. I second that. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of experience. Okay. And then my other question is sort of going back. I remember someone may have been talking about like sort of like sort of like permitting stuff and all. I, mean, I think there's something wrong permitting or something like that. Was it? Maybe it's some regulations. Regulations. That's what it was. Sorry. And I was reading about. Um, when I was looking into figuring out what exactly I wanted to do, it had always come up that I've always, that I've always wanted to get into um, ostriches. Don't ask, I, I think ostriches are really neat, and I heard they're technically kinds of livestock or poultry, so I'm like, cool. But, and I was reading about them, and I read something about the, like a dangerous animals permit or something like that, because like, and then I read a little more into it, and then I realized that it's cool to have a giant feathered reptile that defends all the, that literally no other predator can defeat and gives you giant eggs. It's not cool to have a giant feathered reptile that can kill you with a single kick, you know what I mean? So, and it's also definitely not cool to have a giant feathered reptile and then law enforcement comes in and they're like, all right, hand it over. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, I heard about a dangerous, something, I don't know if that's exactly what it was called, a dangerous animal permit, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Exotic, do you know what Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I think there is exotic animal permitting for people that raise things that aren't <laughs> natural to the area. Yeah. <laughs> and I think wild animals too fall in the exotic animal category, like rehabilitated wild animals yeah. maybe sometimes. Yep. Yep. I had to give up my cheetah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I do know, we're not, um, who was farming emu? Apple cheek. Apple oh, cheek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and they have really probably very similar eggs. They're like this big oh, yeah. turquoise. Right. Yeah. People were doing emu oil. Emu oil. Yeah. yeah. 
Yep. I mean, we've seen been similar was, creatures yeah. raised yeah. in Vermont. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Our are undoubtedly more friendly. Well, that's nice, too. Yeah. They have yeah. funny movements. And just in terms of your other question, I think, yeah, whenever it works, you know, if it's between, you know, before college, in between sessions at college, after school, I went to my first full-time apprenticeship, like, two days after I graduated. But I'd also not have a typical college thing. I was in and out of school for a long time. Left farming, <laughs> came back to farming, so it can look different for everybody. And I started my farm my senior year while being in school. Of, of college. Of college. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some of it might depend on a little bit of what you were talking about, Katie, in terms of Edge's sort of threshold, uh, you know, yeah. your, your personal threshold What's your for, threshold? Uh, you know, vulnerability and financial mm -hmm. instability, frankly. I yeah. Think. Um, a lot. Some people are just much more comfortable yeah. living yeah. in uh, I mean, economically marginalized conditions. Yeah, when frankly. Edge and I met, we both were working for this like nonprofit educational farm. Our housing was provided. He was an employee, so he like was paid a little bit more than me. I was, I don't know what I was, but I got a stipend, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and that was what like. That felt so different. Once we bought land, and had a child, and like started a business, the res different responsibilities add different thresholds. But I think the other thing to know too is like, I'm not sure if you're wanting to like start your own business, but there's um, there was a study done a few years ago that showed that no matter what business you're in, like people who kept a day job or even a part time job were like 33 or 34 percent more likely to still be building their business to still have their business after like three or five years yes. so there's there's definitely like an aspect of flexibility and um, and just room to grow without being like having a lot of pressure so right. yeah. this might be a good moment for you Graham to share the average Annual income. Of oh, American gosh. farmer. Thousand dollars. Worse. Is it worse? Yeah. yeah. I think that the expected annual income is negative fourteen hundred dollars this year, and that'll be an improvement from last year. Huh. But of course, you know these are average numbers across, and you know the farm means you can claim at least two thousand dollars of gross income. So it can be from a pretty small scale to also very large scale with large debt ratios, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I think you do bring up one important thing that I just thought would, um, unless I lost track of it, um, it's just that farming, especially when you're bringing it to your own business, it, one of the reasons I think it's so helpful to work on other farms is because not only do you have to learn the, the science and art of growing whatever you want to grow, you also have to learn how to run a business. And you have a lot of roles from marketing to mm -hmm. accounting mm -hmm. to just distribution to um, fundraising sometimes to uh, all kinds to relationships with people you're leasing land from or who are your clients. So there's a there's a lot of skills to learn that you might not anticipate being there at first. I know that um, it's, that's one of the toughest parts for me is just managing mm -hmm. all of that. I want to be farming, but the business side is really tough too, and we all have different skills. There's a lot of good support services. NOFA Vermont has um, new farmer um, support. There's holistic farm management. Is it only for women to do that? Um, yeah, I don't know if there's a men's one, but there. I mean, overall, there's a pro. There's like an, a national organization that offers it for yeah. Men. There's a, like a lot of great programming <coughs> for business development for farms, especially in Vermont. Yeah, yeah, definitely. For both beginning farmers and yep. folks who've been in it for yep. yeah. I know you had your hand up oh, earlier, yeah. and then and so I have two different questions. Um, I'll just start. You were mentioning how beautiful your farm is in Worcester and all of you are you know, welcoming to the public and everything. Do you have trails there for people at all to come in we have, various times of the year? We don't have, um, not, not right now, mm -hmm. but we have kind of, like the way we've done it is sort of, if someone is not a CSA member, we just have set like a set time, like during CSA pickup is like the best time to come visit or, um, and then there's a lot of trails beyond our property, but I, I couldn't say. <laughs> They're not necessarily like, they do connect with the Callis trails. Mm -hmm. I could walk to where you are. Mm -hmm. um, but for our farm, it's something that I would love to incorporate a little bit more of. So thank you for the reminder. <laughs> <laughs> and I have 
some other questions. Yeah. Um, you were talking about the soil and the infrastructure and how it'd be great to have all that information, I think, collected. And I'm kind of like surprised that maybe that isn't happening. And I remember hearing about something a few years ago, the Gund Institute at UVM. And I thought that they were kind of um, collecting information on resources all over the world. But like, it seems like that would be something Right here in Vermont, that they would be interested in doing. You may know Grandpa, or I don't. I don't know, but the, the, well, you have a relationship. I don't know about that folks. particular gun initiative, but I've I've been talking to a lot of those folks about this um, this this concept of paying folks for producing ecosystem services, and I, I think that there you there are people, there has been a lot of tracking done of changes in soil quality, soil quality, water quality, um, in different things over time. I think there's, but there's more questioning at this point of, in, in trying to associate practices with outcomes in that respect. And I think there's more questioning at, at this point in the farming community and more broadly um, about the types of measurements and models we're using, how accurate they are, what we need to be measuring and um, accounting for, and um, what that translates to in terms of outcomes. And are we going to be prescriptive and say we want to say this practice creates this outcome, or we're going to say you you need to get to this outcome, however you do it within human health, etc. Means <coughs> and that's what we want to see. So um, there certainly is testing, but there's a larger conversation right now around like um, a lot of testing is like um, through nutrient management plans on larger farms, but through soil tests that folks do on smaller farms, usually about the top six inches of a soil core. Takes a sample from like if it was a room like this, we take a bunch of samples, maybe like six different ones from different points, and there's a lot more questioning of well, what are we, what do we know just from that top six inches, and where could we, what else can we know? How accurate is it? But it sounds like you have other stuff to say. I think you're maybe referring to, and I don't know a lot about it. I've, I've read it a while ago, but they're starting to measure carbon sequestering and looking at the value in soil versus solar or wind and how that there can be a payback for that with farmers and I know that they I had heard that they're starting to test um, with some larger farms but I don't know much about it but I know it's I've heard it's in the works which is really interesting um, yes I had a question for Kate you mentioned um, kind of the concept of community sufficiency mm -hmm. versus self-sufficiency and I think a lot about the cooperative economies, especially like in rural areas. Um, are there specific strategies that your farm or practices that you yeah. do and for the other farmers too? If you yeah, questions? so for, that is a really good question. Um, I So for us, it started out as like, we had this vision of having a full diet CSA. Um, and so that would have also included like honey and maple syrup and grains along with meat and vegetables um and being that it was like two of us and one per, we at the time also had someone who else was living and working on the farm um and i had a baby so it was just like not it it was just too much to do for all of us and i i just started realizing like just starting to think more in the community mindset um looking around at the time <clears throat> we were trading vegetables for raw milk with Rogers Farmstead. And we started just looking around at like who else around us was producing things that we had originally intended to produce. So um, like Graham is right down the road and well, you weren't at the time, but now you, <laughs> now you are. And um, we have a neighbor who sells, um, who raises sheep and uh, neighbors who raise, who grow mushrooms and maple syrup. So at different times, what we've done is worked with those people to add to like offer an add-on to CSA members so we've sold um, we've kind of just been like a conduit for mm -hmm. lamb or maple syrup or mushrooms um, and that way we can offer a wider variety without us having to do all the work it does come with the work of just like managing those mm -hmm. things but um, and it and it isn't like something that we um, really advertise outright because it changes depending on the season and depending on like what those other producers have at the, mo at the time but 
it works out really well. So when people have something extra, we just like add it in in our CSA email and say, we have this and then we can either take orders or just bring it to the pickup. Um, and I think overall, just what that's helped us do in our approach is again, start focusing on like, what are we doing really well? And then what can we, so how can we maximize what we're doing well in and get rid of the things that are just losses? And so one of like, we tried growing sweet potatoes one year and it was just a total flop. And so now we just purchased sweet potatoes from another farmer and it's actually more, it makes more financial sense for us to do that than to try to grow the sweet potatoes. Um, otherwise, and, and we still get our customers sweet potatoes. So we're always like very clear on like they came from this farm, but I think too, just the more we do that in general, I feel like it could send out some ripple effects for just how we can create systems where we're not necessarily in competition, but more like combining what we're all doing and work together, so. I like the term community sufficiency too, because it used to be a long time ago that everybody was self-sufficient and now the world has changed and not everybody's able to. So as a community, you can take your self-sufficiency and share it with everybody else. Yeah. And kind of that homestead uh, method in terms of mm -hmm. with more families. Yeah. That's a neat way to look at it too. Did you still have a question? I do, yes. Hit it. Uh, I have a question for Missy. So your uh, story uh, about uh, your first and second graders uh, really resonated with me. And uh, I'm guessing uh, over a year's time, you see hundreds, if not thousands of kids. Um, I'm interested in, as you look at those kids, what percentage you think um, would benefit by flipping their learning experience? Um, meaning... You mean their classroom uh, learning yeah, experience? The, the predominant time is on the land. Yeah. And the add-on is the reading and math teacher. It's my new mission in life. Awesome. <laughs> I, I think everybody's a different type of learner. Um, not one is the same. and. You know, our model of education is the one size fits all, and that doesn't work. And I think in the demographics that I work in, which are pretty, um, pretty uh, high socioeconomic needs, um, a lot of trauma ridden kids, and I would say probably 75%, no, maybe 50% of those kids really need a different learning style different learning experience, working with their hands and um, learning through their hands. And when I see those kids, and that was just one example, I see it a lot where the teachers are in awe every time that they're outside. And we're, we're not just going on a field trip. They are embedding their curriculum, their standards that they have to learn in the classroom or embedding that into the outdoor classroom and then bringing it back to the inside classroom. And I, I mean, I know that those kids that have a different learning style if they had it every day, would thrive unbelievably. And it's my mission to help change schools that way. <laughs> it's a very ambitious one, but yeah. 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 Any other questions? I, I have one more thing I'd like to, it's maybe not so much a question, but a little like, I don't know, I just would like to get your input on something I've been thinking about a lot. And one of the things I'm noticing Tonight is that you know on this panel we are not do not have represented uh, a sort of more I guess what we would consider now traditional larger scale uh, dairy operator mm -hmm. um, and as many of you I think know uh, the dairy industry in Vermont is in crisis um, and has been for a really long time um, and then we're seeing a very rapid shift uh, in the number of dairies um, and also therefore in the landscape uh, as it as it's sort of a lot of it moves out of farming or other farms, because you know, some consolidate and become even larger. Um, and I guess I'm curious, I, I, it's something I'm thinking about a lot myself because I am as susceptible to anyone, um, to nostalgia, I guess, right? And not really wanting to see the landscape change. 
and our communities change because it is it does have a huge ripple effect on our communities. I think it's these, even some of these farms that you know utilize practices that may maybe are are questionable in some cases because of the you know generally because they're compelled to for economic reasons. But I guess I'm curious. Um, hmm, how do I want to phrase this? You know. Are we sometimes being a victim of our own nostalgia? Uh, you know, in what ways do you, how do you interpret the sort of changing culture of agriculture in Vermont? Mm -hmm. um, and that shift, which I think, you know, the three of you actually are really represent um, in a lot of ways. I think in very positive ways. Um, and yet I still personally, I guess this is a really selfish question, but I still personally like, you know, just like want to cling to this like, you know, these like big open landscapes of cows grazing and mm -hmm. I don't know, shit. That wasn't a very yeah. good question, sorry. <laughs> um, but I just, you know, I, I, I It's actually yeah. a really important question yeah. because it's changing fast mm -hmm. and um, I don't know if we can make a statewide collaborative effort to really help, but we are, I and mean, we're trying to preserve this landscape. And mm -hmm. um, what does that mean? And I think putting value in our food, and if we have that value in our food, then we'll have that value in our landscape. But if farmers are gonna continue to struggle mm -hmm. and make their negative $1,500 a year, which most of us don't mind because it's a lifestyle um, choice, but I think if farmers could, get paid a livable wage by um, by having that fair value on food, then our farms would be there more. And I think farmers have to really be creative and think mm -hmm. of what is up and coming in today with being able to buy our food on Amazon and go to Costco. Um, how do we, how are we creative in our market? And how do we make sure we can feed everybody um, no matter what their socioeconomic background is? And, um, and when we have all that infrastructure there, then our farms will continue to be there. And dairy is a big part of it. I mean, we need dairy farms. Yeah, so Edge and I uh, lived <clears throat> and worked on Apple Cheek Farm for two years before, uh, before starting Good Heart. And at that time, we were, yeah, so at that time, Apple Cheek, we were milking like 50 cows, and we went there specifically because we were interested in dairy mm. and uh, drank a lot of milk. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and we found that personally, like that scale, milking 50 cows, it, it was not very fulfilling to us. Um, we loved being out moving cows on pasture, but we didn't love the, um, the milking part. Well, at least with that many cows. <laughs> and, um, and I know that, you know, they're no longer doing dairy. Um, and, you know, they, they also felt that economic aspect of dairy. Um, and, and so it's interesting kind of taking it from like, we went from like, okay, we had this veg, like really mostly a veggie background, went to Apple Cheek, got like this grazing and dairy background. And to hear John, who was um, one of the owners, just talk about grass and cow, it was like being in farm church. Like he was <laughs> just like, oh my gosh, like if you want to talk to someone about pastures, like... He's awesome. And even just seeing him with the cows, because there's, you know, they they respond to different people differently, but he also is just like this cow whisperer where he would just be like this, they'd all just like go. <laughs> um, and so it was this really amazing thing. And so it's interesting thinking about, you know, seeing people who are so, like they just have the ecological part of it down so well and um and yet that specific size seems to be the size that's disappearing it's like you now have like micro dairies or like really big dairies and that mid-sized farm is like really hard to make work um 
but on the other but on like the land use aspect like these big swaths of open land that are so beautiful um they're also like so our farm is we have about 15 acres on a hillside that used to be a hundreds of acres in one farm and that has slowly kind of broken down into smaller chunks that's pretty we're the only farm on that hillside now and um I think that if we want to keep land open, as wonderful as like the current use laws are compared to other states, we need to think about how are we going to accommodate smaller farms now? Because right now, like we're keeping that land open, um, but we don't qualify, well, we qualify financially for current use, but um, the amount that it would cut off is so negligible um, because our main farm building we also live in. So we'd have to like move out of the building that is our wash and pack shed and our office and our dry storage and curing in order to like really have any meaningful tax um, relief. <laughs> and so to me, like when I look at the future of farming, like in Vermont and keeping land open and in use, um, it has to start to incorporate smaller parcels of land. So if we can go from, I was talking to someone um, from Massachusetts, I think, and the current use there is like 10 acres, which is, a, it's a different landscape. Um, so how can we look at that and say, okay, we might actually have just a lot of micro dairies and we still need land for those cats. We still need hay, you know, and how can we make sure that we still have hay and it's not all CBD, you know, um, or all solar. Um, I don't have an answer, but those are things mm -hmm. that I think are really important to, yeah, start think, start talking more about. Balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and how do we want the, how do we want, so the other thing too, like just in Worcester, it's a pretty good example. There's an old dairy farm that had been for sale for like a million dollars for about five, at least five or six years. And when the owner passed away, it went up for auction for like $600,000 and all of that land that was I think they may have paid some of it, but it's now a CBD farm, which is great because it's keeping it in some sort of agricultural use. Um, but no farmer could afford that land. Mm -hmm. And um, the buildings needed a lot of work. Like the person who was able to purchase it was someone who um, is, is coming at it from a different agricultural use, which is going to become more and more important in our state. Um, but no dairy farmer would have been able to purchase that. So, um, and then there's other parcels that are hay, but one may very well turn all into solar, which is also very important. So it's like, what are the balance, what kind of balance do we want? Because all of them are important and useful in our communities and, um, where does it, yeah, where do they all fit? <laughs> so. Yeah, and it's such a huge question and topic. Um, you know, I think it's one thing to think, I think one thing I would bring forward is just connecting this thing, you, you're drawing this picture of is transforming ag in Vermont over time and sort of this, this, um, this crisis in the farm economy in particular, in particular the dairy economy. Um, and I think it's, it's important for us, if we're going to make change on this, to, to really try to recognize that um, this isn't just ag transforming in Vermont, this is socioeconomic transformation globally and that has drastic ecological and climatological implications. So that consolidation and concentration in industry is happening across sectors and across the world and it's not just dairy in Vermont, it's dairy in, in all the states and, this, and the scales that are at this point finding a niche to survive are the micro, like 50 to 100 cattle, mostly organic, some conventional, and then the micro side, which is smaller processors producing specialty products or, or raw milk in some cases. Um, and then the, the larger scales. So you're seeing like a drawing down at the middle and stretching into either end. Um, and there's a lot that I think 
is not so much about ag, but really about power and about the economy. And um, we really need to show some solidarity with other um, oppressed folks globally in the landless worker movements and farmers across the world, but also just with people of in the working class across this country and across the state and mutually educate one another about the issues we're, we're all having. Um, Ag is certainly a, an outlier in some respects, but there, I that's that nostalgia I hear a lot about this open land and maintaining it open. And I think what I try to bring to those policy conversations when I hear that, and also just to community conversations, is um, I, don't, I don't think our old farming systems, at least in our culture, really have that much of a good ecological legacy. The sheep farming in Vermont led to econo mm -hmm. econ mm -hmm. ecological catastrophe, and it was economic catastrophe too. And again, that's an example of the economy driving. Mm -hmm. Our practices and our relationship to the landscape with disastrous consequences. Um, but it's really about fun, like functional, equitable working landscapes, mm -hmm. right? And to me, that means most of the pastures are going to have trees in them, not forests, but they're going to be trees integrated into those landscapes as alley crops. We're going to have hay growing between trees at 200 feet apart, and you're going to have animals grazing between them. Um, you might have more cooperative economic relationships with your neighbors, and hopefully more with the state and other interests. Um, and you know, there's that there's this weird balance in Vermont right now where 6,500 plus small diversified farms and growing, 700 and fewer dairies and shrinking, and shrinking. but 90 percent of the land agriculturally manages in dairy. So there's an equity issue there related to land access and how land is apportioned. I think we also have to recognize, like, explore the financial situations of the people who are actually holding that land because they're often like land rich and totally cash poor or in debt, and like, that brings mm -hmm. up that question of what the hell happens to this mm -hmm. when things crash beyond consolidation, what consolidation can handle in, in Little Old Vermont, or when you look at the industry, you know, projections in dairy, and you see they're talking about nineteen thousand to twenty-five thousand cattle dairies being the normal in ten to twenty years, and you got to ask those farmers of Vermont right now who are still growing, like, do you think there's going to be size? farms that size of Vermont that can compete with others. Mm -hmm. That said, I think we're also really well positioned. <laughs> we, are have, we have water resources, like in terms of climate change, in terms of access to functional landscapes and um, biological capital and natural capital in our community capital, mm -hmm. I think. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, in terms of dairy and where your question went, like. Vermont is not going to stop growing grass and trees well. That's like what grows well here. Woody <laughs> and yeah, rocks. Like, yeah, perennial plants and woodies. Like, and so dairy is a really natural fit here. I think it's just a question about what's the, what are the economic forces that shape it? Mm -hmm. You know, because you could have, you look at, I grew up in East Montpelier, like it's a landscape of 20 to, what, 5 to 20 to 100 acre parcels, some old fields, some in farming. And we could have community managed herds going through, you know, mm -hmm. The commons of sort, depending on what kind of economic system is supporting. Um, so, I, you know, there's there's <laughs> there's the global things that are really challenging and scary, and then there's the local things that we have a lot of capital to, mm -hmm. to make use of. Oh, such a nice note. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe think about closing it out. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, before before we maybe give a final round of applause and, and gratitude to our panelists. <laughs> Um, I, I do want to take this opportunity to just make one small, gentle pitch for this organization that I represent and that Graham works for, um, and I know Katie has served on the board. Um, and we are a member-based organization. We have a really, really modest budget of uh, just a little over $200,000 a year. Um, we'd like to think that we work way beyond that budget in terms of getting stuff done. Uh, but, you know, a lot of the work that we're doing, I mean, Graham, I think, really summed up really kind of nicely in his closing remarks there. You know, that is sort of where we operate in that sphere of trying to sort of thread the needle and, you know, <clears throat> figure out how do we move forward in the state that is so bountiful and has so much opportunity and is so challenged, um, often by economic forces way beyond our control um, and other other issues of equity and justice, too. Um, 
So I do have membership envelopes here for you if you're so inclined. If all you would like to do is give us your email, and we, so we throw can, great member. We throw great parties. Great member parties. We give parties. away free stickers to everybody who comes <laughs> to make America great again. A perfect time of year to put that on your car. <laughs> we are entering the season. This one says farmers are healthcare providers. This one says. Healthy soils, healthy humans. So please come on up. Even if you don't give me money or your email address, you're welcome to take a sticker or two. So thank you guys so thank much. You. Thank you, Michelle, and the California Library. Thank you to the woman. I'm sorry. Orca. Orca. But your, your name is again? Christine. Christine. Thank you to Christine for being here with us tonight.